Celebrating 44 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, as we approach the end of a stressful year, millions looking for help putting food on the table. Plus, the EPA misses a deadline. It could affect what happens in the new year. In Southern Gardening, what gardener doesn't love the perfect gift ideas for Christmas? And the story of Rick Meister, who lost his legs in a farming accident, but found his way back into his tractor. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. There is no question that the nation's economic uncertainty hangs over every American, and for many of them, there's the added uncertainty of getting enough to eat. That problem, of course, started before COVID, but services relying on federal dollars and food donations are still trying to fill the gaps. John Torpy has more. Increased unemployment caused by the global coronavirus pandemic has pushed more people who are having trouble making ends meet to seek food assistance. As we look at our distribution um, in the fall, months leading up to Thanksgiving, we've experienced a 30% increase in our distribution, and that's pounds of food distributed. At places like the Food Bank of Iowa, those distributing supplies have become frontline workers in the battle against COVID-19. A year ago, we were distributing about a million, million and a half pounds of food a month. Today, two to two and a half million pounds per month. A year ago, 30% of the food that we distributed was USDA commodity food. Today, it's a bigger number of pounds distributed, and 60% of that is USDA commodity food. Book relies on a number of USDA programs to help fill empty cupboards in the Hawkeye State but she is well aware the funding may dry up at the end of December. I am worried about change in administration and what will happen with our USDA food supply chain. The CARES Act was unusually successful, but that money's gone now, and there are more people living in poverty, more people that are poor right now. According to officials at the West Texas Food Bank, the number of people requesting food assistance in the western part of the Lone Star State is double what it was at this time last year. And it's where we've been since we've been hanging at about 1.2 to 1.3 million pounds of food a month. Just like her counterpart in Iowa, Campbell has come to rely on USDA programs like the Emergency Food Assistance Program or TFAP to fill the gap. She also is worried about what will happen if Congress remains deadlocked over relief funding. We basically just drop off a cliff. I mean, we go back to normal kind of farm bill levels for TFAP and, and bonus and entitlement, but trade and CARES and farmers to family commodities all go away. And so that creates a huge issue for how do we continue to meet the needs of our community the EPA missed an important deadline right after Thanksgiving affecting renewable fuels. That industry has long looked for ways to diversify its revenue streams. A lawsuit could now be the result. Peter Tubbs has that story. The Trump administration's Environmental Protection Agency missed its November 30 statutory deadline to set the 2021 Renewable Volume Obligations, or RVOs, under the Renewable Fuel Standard. Releasing the standard in the preceding year is required under the RFS statute and often begins with a proposed rule released in the previous summer to allow time for public comment. The EPA failed to issue even the proposed rule in 2020, blaming COVID-19 for the delay. Growth Energy, a trade association of ethanol producers, notified the EPA of their intent to sue over the missed deadline for 2021 EVO targets. The EPA now has 60 days to issue the obligation specifics or face a lawsuit. Federal figures show overall domestic fuel consumption has fallen to a 30-year low. With the RVOs in place, biofuel and fossil fuel producers get much needed guidance for their renewable fuel blending obligations for the coming year. Without hard obligation numbers, the market may underestimate their blending needs and cut the demand for renewable fuels. 
the final volume requirement for 2020 was 20.09 billion gallons, an increase of 17 million gallons from the 2019 requirement. In a couple of weeks, we'll have an extended version of the story you're about to see. In the meantime, we felt it important to bring you information about the potential reappearance of a bacteria affecting certain farm animals that was thought to be eliminated. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. The near eradication of brucellosis, a costly bacterial disease that affected a large number of U.S. cattle herds in the early part of the last century, is one of the nation's major livestock and public health triumphs. It was very prevalent in, in 1934 when our brucellosis program began. Maybe they figure maybe 50% of the herds were infected. Um, the program began, they started testing for the disease, removing those animals that were infected. By 1957, they reckoned about 13% of the herds were infected in the United States, like 234,000 herds. And then in the early 40s, they developed the vaccine. In 2008, for the first time, they, there were no infected herds in the United States. Experts worry, however, that infected wildlife, particularly elk and bison in the Yellowstone National Park area, are slowly reversing some of that progress in cattle. The disease can cause cows to abort their calves and have milk production fall off dramatically. There's additional concern that another strain of brucella bacteria that particularly affects hogs is being spread by wild boar in the southern United States. Brucella, the bacteria that causes the disease, can also be passed to humans, often through unpasteurized milk, and causes fevers and other symptoms that, left untreated, can become chronic. Because the vaccine currently used on cattle and bison isn't as effective on wildlife like elk, Scientists are working on a new version. In Montana, state veterinarian Dr. Marty Zalewski, who has seen area cattle producers have to deal with the return of the disease, has been encouraging federal officials to move ahead with a policy change. There is a fairly long history of nations wanting to weaponize brucellosis um, and use it as a bioterrorist weapon. If you're a terrorist, and you choose your weapon of choice for Bruce, as Brucella abortus, you're not the brightest crayon in the box. This disease is, we have a ready test for this disease. The incubation period, so the time from exposure until illness can be several weeks. Um, we have a, a very inexpensive and effective treatment for this disease. Contrast this type of an agent to Ebola or anthrax, it just doesn't make sense to me. My concern is that without interventions that are effective, brucellosis is going to spread throughout the entire contiguous range of elk in the Rockies and the Northwest. The outcome, if we don't develop better tools, is somewhat bleak. We'll take a short break, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, you'll meet Rick Meister, who lost his legs in a horrific farming accident. A priest actually gave him the last rites, and in the hospital, he said his goodbyes. But he survived, and thanks to a special program, found his way back into a tractor. He says he never let the accident keep him from getting back to work. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. 
At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. On the lighter side, are you looking for that perfect gift idea for your favorite yard owner? In Southern Gardening Today, Gary Bachman says there are plenty of garden gadgets to give to your gifted and giddy gardener. Go for it. What gardener doesn't like to get garden-related gifts for Christmas? I remember one year, Kate got me 16 tons of crushed limestone. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few items that will actually fit under the Christmas tree. Of course, one of the best quick Christmas gift ideas for anyone is a holiday plant. Poinsettias come in all shapes, sizes, and many different colors. They would be an easy gift for that office Christmas party. And a final live gift idea? This mixed container features a dwarf Alberta spruce as the thriller plant. In this arrangement, mixed matrix pansies fill in with a lot of color, along with the white sweet alyssum and the chartreuse lysomachia spilling over the side. What makes this a good Christmas gift? You can decorate the tree. Moving on to another garden gift idea, plant stands and baskets make wonderful Christmas and multi-use gifts. I've had my eye on this pink flamingo. It looks great in the garden with this selection of marimoms. From holiday plants to whatever's in season, baskets and plant stands are gifts that keep on giving. And as far as decorations go, everybody loves fun garden art. There's lots of whimsical metal art available, like these fun decorative trucks to animals like the bright red bird. I also like using these elegant wooden cloche frames to display beautiful plants. Don't forget your favorite gardener this holiday season. Now, Katie, close your eyes. She's gonna love this. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Time now for the markets with Zach Ashmore. He's not so giddy, and there's a good reason for it. Zach? Thanks, Mike. Markets took a dive last week, everything down except lumber. Weather and typical market forces appear to be at play here, so let's take a look. Seems dire, but remember, just because a commodity is down doesn't necessarily mean disaster. Analysts say December slumps are normal, and they're predicting January highs. More on that later. For now, corn and soybeans looking good, much of that having to do with weather. At least that's what market analyst John Roach has to say. Well, we came in this week with a, a better rainfall there than was expected over the weekend, and then a forecast for more uh, rain out forward. In fact, is this next two weeks will be about the wettest period that they've had in Brazil. Uh, they need the rain. They've been dry. Uh, but so far, their crops have been able to hold together pretty good. Uh, remember, corn, 70% uh, of the crop is actually a second crop. And so it might be just a little bit later because the early plantings didn't go in quite as early as normal. Uh, because of dry conditions, uh, but uh, the, uh, the market really needs to, uh, 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 to have a big crop down in, in Brazil, and so that rain's very important. Well, I think we have plenty of people who want to buy corn. The market got away this year uh, uh, from, uh, from users. It moved up much quicker than people thought that it would. Uh, uh, farmers sold into it maybe heavier than, uh, than they really uh, had anticipated with the higher market. So we have farmers who want to buy inventory back, and we have users who want to buy inventory. But the people who, who brought the corn market up, which, is the, which are the spec funds, uh, uh, the professional traders, they have quit buying crops. And in fact, is they haven't uh, uh, added to their net long position across the crop market in 30 
30 days. They've been they've been selling during the last 30 days. And uh, we just uh, received the report this week. They took off uh, 50,000 contracts this week alone. Uh, they've liquidated 100,000 contracts since their peak. And uh, uh, and uh, selling in uh, soybeans was heavy and, uh, and and also in wheat. So the people who took prices higher, the spec funds, have quit buying. We also saw this week in soybeans, we saw the uh, 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 very uh, disappointing export sales as well with the uh, slowdown in uh, Chinese buying. Moving on to cattle, also in a slump, but not by much, only down about one cent. Much of that having to do with the second round of COVID lockdowns. Normally that would mean prices up, but we actually have an ample supply right now. That and future stock looking good. Once again, John Roach. Well, I think we have uh, we have a couple of different things. First of all, we have really good weather. We uh, we've had uh, uh, cattle closeouts uh, uh, with you know real efficient gains, and so we're putting more tonnage into the marketplace uh, uh, because of that uh, better weather. We're also having a slow I don't want to call it slowdown, but but uh, packing plants have have some capacity limitations because of the distancing and, and uh, social distancing and so forth, and so uh, uh, we are having a little bit of a of a sluggy. Uh, demand side of it with 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 ample supplies. Remember, we we're just going through another round of COVID lockdowns too. So uh, so that's throwing a little curve on the on the demand side. I, I think there's a certain amount of caution on the part of uh, of uh, people because of the situation we're in uh, uh, with COVID, and I think there's caution because a lot of equity was lost this year. And uh, so uh, it makes it harder to get back in. And with high feed costs, unless you have feed availability, uh, that's going to slow you down. So we think placements are going to be a little slower. We have sell signals right now in the feeder cattle market. We think that market could soften a little bit here. Uh, but we really don't want to be negative on a long term. Uh, we think prices will do better. We think as we come out of the winter and we start to have some a light at the end of the tunnel here, uh, we could see really strong demand uh, out forward uh, under the the right kind of circumstances if our vaccines come and we start to get some confidence in being able to go back and live our lives. As I said earlier, analysts predict grain prices will rise in January 2021. Why? Well, a lot of it has to do with supply and demand. Lower supply of corn next year, but not by much, and much higher demand for ethanol. How? Well, according to Reuters, sugar, also used to make fuel. India and Brazil growing less sugar due to weather conditions means more corn needed to make up slack. Just shows how one commodity can affect another, and in this case, that means corn could be in higher demand. The USDA released highlights from the December 2020 farm income forecast last week. The major takeaways, net farm income up about 41%, net cash farm income also up about 22%. How? Well, a combination of cash receipts from farming and farm-related income, including government payments, minus cash expenses. It doesn't mean all farmers making more money, but it does appear ag can remain stable during these trying times. Finally, a Texas company, Corn Board Manufacturing, says it's building a plant in Iowa to produce shipping pallets from corn stover. That would be the dry husk stalks and leaves left over from harvest. According to AP, the $15 million plant will employ up to 30 people, a novel way to make use of an overlooked resource. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Today we celebrate once again more than 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have an incredible story about a farmer who made a harvest decision a few years ago that changed his life forever but only in how he gets the job done on the farm today. David Miller has more. I grew up here, the family farm is south of the lake and I went to school here and I just stayed here. And in 1990, I bought my own farm. 24 years after starting work on his Northwestern Iowa farm, Rick Meister began another day of harvest on his operation near Lakeview. October 8th, 2014. The Saturday of Labor Day that year, we had some windstorm come through and we had some corn come down. So I said, well, we're gonna go out and open up the field so the chopper can come through. As day turned slowly to dusk, the downed corn began jamming in the combine head. I was going through, the head plugged once, I shut everything off, got out, unplugged it, got back in the combine. The head filled up again with the downed corn. I shut it off, got back out, got it unplugged, 
while I was going along the next time, well, it happened again. Well, I don't know, frustration or whatever, it just, I had the corn head down and I left, I left the combine run. It was my own fault. I left it run while well, I was out there and I about had all the corn stalks left and I reached and the second row gathering chain grabbed my blue jeans. The chain did its job. It gathered me in and I had to hold myself out as I would have went through the corn head. It cut off my left leg above the calf, about the calf area, and it also had the right leg, but I fell to the ground before it cut the right leg all the way off. Jared, one of his three sons, was the first to arrive. So he walked around the end of the combine. He seen me. He, he goes, Dad, what do I got to do? I said, oh, we got to stop bleeding. Jared phoned his brother Jake to come to the scene of the accident and provide more help. Eventually, both boys used their belts as tourniquets on their father's legs. EMS arrived. An attempt to get a life flight helicopter failed, and Meister was taken about 10 miles to the nearest hospital in Sac City. Meister's wife, Jackie, was brought to the emergency room. And then they finally got a hold of a life flight, but it was going to be 45 minutes. And by then, the priest came, and the boys got Jackie, who was home here working. They got her, and we said our goodbyes, and that's the last I remember. He was airlifted to a hospital in Omaha, Nebraska, for emergency surgery. And I woke up in Omaha like at 2.30 in the morning. The doctor came into the room and spoke with the family. He says, boys, your dad's been through hell. And he goes, I had to do the hardest thing a doctor does, is ask for the saw in surgery. He said, you know, but I can see your dad. He's going to move on. He's going to make it. He's he just got, you can see the confidence in you guys. Meister spent eight days in the hospital and another 11 in the Lincoln, Nebraska Rehabilitation Center. Before leaving for home, he was told about a provision in the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act called Agribility. The federal program helps producers with disabilities get started on the farm or return to farm life after a serious accident. She goes, is there a program that helps farmers out in Iowa? I said, Boy, I don't know, you know, and she goes, well, every state has one, you know, but it's probably not the same program. Well, they did some searching. They found out it was Easter seals for me. So they have, they set it up. So then when I got home, I called Easter seals. Tracy Kenninger is the director of the program run by Easter Seals, Iowa, located in the capital city of Des Moines. Easter Seals Rural Solutions Program started in 1986, even prior to Agribility. We were one of the first programs in the entire country who arranged a, a program specifically for farming with a disability. In any given year, we'll support anywhere from 130 to 150 Iowa farm family members with disabilities. We travel directly to the farms and work one-on-one -on -one with the farm family members with disabilities. And it's not really just working with the person with the disability, it's working with the entire family unit. And we're right by their side every step along the way until they can fully rehabilitate and be engaged in the farming operation after the onset of their disability. Meister began working with the nonprofit that has a 90-year history of helping anyone with a disability or special needs. There is no charge for the Rural Solutions Service. However, there is a cost associated with some equipment. Meister paid a nominal fee for a motorized wheelchair and a specialized tricycle. Meister experimented with some of his own solutions, but he had mixed results. Well, I said, boys, let's weld a tractor seat on the end of that. I fit on the skid loader, and I'd sit on this, and it worked to get me in a tractor and stuff, but I had to wait till somebody was there to get me out. Like, if I got done, I'd have to wait. And the boys seen this lift at, a, at the Farm Progress show one time, and they said, Dad, this is what you need. Rural Solutions assisted in acquiring the specialized lift that makes it easier for him to get around the farm. I can go three inches off the ground or 12 feet high. It has got me into anything I want. Combine, tractor, skid loader, the older tractors, you know, it has got me. 
So far, I haven't got stuck yet. <laughs> Meister is often reflected on what happened that day nearly five years ago, but he has never let the outcome of the accident stop him from getting back to work. Yeah, we made that decision in the hospital. I said, Jackie, we're not, that, we're gonna try. And my wife, she was a motivator and she, and with the kids, I wanted to, you know, we had too many plans at the farm that I wanted to see completed. And, you know, they, we, we were in the process, but you know how that all takes time. And yeah, this was, I, I didn't want to sit. I wanted to keep going. Amazing what he accomplished with the right kind of help and a lot of determination. Well, next week, a different story about some folks who got the right kind of help after a natural disaster. We travel back to a heartbreak tornado on Easter Sunday in Walthall County, Mississippi. They were close to the land, loving it, they say, with all their hearts, but when they looked outside, they thought that a bomb had gone off. Like that, they lost 200 acres of timber, but they recovered, and with a county agent's help, learned more about just how extension matters. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Stay healthy. Merry Christmas.